how we're currently running things in the lab and how can we improve on that. Um, so I spend a little bit of time doing emails. I'd probably say that's the time that, like, that's the hardest thing I have to catch up on because I'm in the lab so much that I'm trying to sit down and catch up on that as well as keeping up with my lab notebook, which um, in my previous role we didn't have lab notebooks. We had to write protocols for everything and get them approved. Um, so now for me to sit down and have to keep up with my lab notebook and keep it in like a GMP fashion is, you know, it takes a good chunk of the Manufacturing, I would probably say I was in meetings probably about 50% of my day. Um, I was down in the lab only a little bit, um, uh, pretty much supporting manufacturing and <coughs> supporting the assay uh, that I was working on. Very rarely got to actually be in the lab and do experiments. Um, a lot of what I did was also to support regulatory inspections, so to serve as a subject matter expert for um, regulatory inspections questions came up or documents needed to be drafted and things like that. So a lot of times I um, would be in front of like the FDA or the EMA um, defending what we did or how we implemented it and how, you know, we handle it in run of the two phases. So that was very different, I would say. And that in my previous role, I was very rarely in the lab. I was mostly in meetings and um, leading cross-functional teams of trying to implement new projects and things like that. But uh, I didn't manage it team, but I'd have to bring together the resources to get the job done, of getting assays validated or getting um, assay transfers from one site to the other site. So um, it, was, it was kind of challenging, you know, trying to work um, outside of my comfort zone and learning how to work in a GMP environment because I came from academics just like everybody else and then kind of getting thrown into GMP and, and all of a sudden having to get used to all of the documentation and practices. So I think I, could, uh, I have um, similar um, aspects of my job that because I do this whole job. So we work in a, a GMP manufacturing facility where documentation is extremely heavy. Um, just to be sure that um, all the decisions you make and all the experiments that are run are uh, fully compliant and they are um, very visible to what actually has been done in terms of to support uh, the food back. So for our, in terms of uh, food vaccine manufacturing. So I would say I spent a, mo a lot of my day um, reviewing protocols and reports, um, working on other documents, risk assessments. Um, uh, there's a, so we have a regulatory filing with the FDA uh, that, that we have uh, um, keep up with uh, to ensure that everything is, is in line for that we're performing according to our license. Uh, so it's very document heavy. Um, there's a lot of uh, science aspect, you know, to it. So this is why, you know, we're um, in the roles that we have is that to to understand the science and to know uh, what needs to be done to, to ensure a, a quality and safe product that, that comes out the door. So I think, I think that's, that's about, you know, it's, it's most, of, most of my day is, is working on the documents and ensuring that we're, the science is correct and in everything that we do. Thanks. Well, that's, uh, yeah, yeah it's like my days are um, generally meetings. There's a lot of email. I have a, um, a global role, so I have customers that I support around the world, so the emails never stop because somebody's always awake and having a problem. Um, document heavy is the, the biggest change that I had, as everyone mentioned, from academics to industry. Um, if we have an outbreak or other things that we detect, it does have serious implications on our customers, so it has to be right and it has to be documented. We have to have all the QC in place, so there's a lot of work that goes into that. Um, a lot of 7 a.m. calls, a lot of midnight calls because it's daylight for someone somewhere. Um, meetings on strategy, which is again things that I didn't think I would do, but we keep the science. The, the group that I work with is really technical. We keep the science and marketing. So we make sure the materials that go out to customers are accurate scientifically and make sense because um, they're written by people in marketing, not traditional science people. So th there's a lot of that. It's, it's keeping the science in the different aspects of the company. Okay, so I, my role um, is part of assay development. 
and also assay validation. So the part of the development is kind of like the fun part because it's the part that you, you get a request for somebody, um, I need to look for this biomarker in this clinical trial or for this biomarker in this preclinical study. And then you have to come out with an assay. Um, there might be reagents out there commercially <coughs> available or reagents that you actually have to come out and create or an assay that you have to develop. So that's kind of the fun part. Everybody wants to do that and then you have, you know, you meet with your group and uh, it's the feasibility of doing this assay, maybe you should do it like this. It's what, it's what I believe it most resemble what I used to do as a postdoc, you know, trying to, well, as a graduate student. So that's the fun part. Um, one thing is that you still have to document this very well, even though this research is going to move towards a um, GLP, in my case, or GCLP, or sometimes GMP. Um, so uh, that's the second part. You know, the second part is now you spend a lot of time developing this assay. It has to be a validatable assay. So it has to be an assay that you can repeat, that is accurate that is robust, that you can make little changes and then you can validate. And that the process of the validation is a process that requires documentation, to, uh, uh, writing before, what, how you're gonna validate that assay, writing reports, um, presentations in front of the team, this is how I validated this, these are the results, uh, and then application of those assays into, your, in, into the clinical trials getting data, analyzing, uh, sharing with other teams inside your company. So there's many different fa you know, uh, phases in which um, sometimes you are a scientist, sometimes you are more like uh, helping a regulatory person, sometimes you are helping the, the marketing by, uh, by uh, uh, having to write reports or things that support what you're doing. So it's, it could be, um, so it's very, uh, I would say that some things are more fun than other things, but it's not just all, all documentation, you know? So, <laughs> so um, could y'all talk a little bit about how you got your job? Did you get it by answering an ad in the newspaper, or by networking, or one of the kind of events, or? I'll start off. Um, okay, so I'll start with my first job. Um, so my first job, um, I actually addressed uh, or applied to an ad online with, with Mark. Um, I didn't know anybody at the company. I just applied online and um, happened to have a skill set that they were looking for specifically. Um, so I tried to make sure that um, my resume matched their job description fair, like, pretty well. Basically, tried to pull out every line where they wanted something, where I could show where I've done exactly what it was that they were looking for. So. Um, so, I, I know that's not how a lot of people get their jobs, but it, that ended up working out for me. Um, with my current role, um, I had a really good friend who was in, grad, who was in my graduate lab who we remained friends, and um, she actually forwarded me the job posting. She didn't work for Biogen, but um, she forwarded me the posting and said, hey, Biogen's a great company, I know you're looking, here's a, a role that I think like, fits your criteria really well. And she happened to know somebody in the company, so she forwarded my resume on to that person in the company. Um, and that resulted in me getting the job. So, um, probably done both, you know. In a lot of cases, I would say if you do know somebody, you know, build your network, you know, your colleagues, your friends, you know, things like that, stay in touch. Because you never know, five, ten years down the road, they'll be approaching you maybe for a job, or you might say, hey, I'm looking, do you know of anything available? And, you know, and they'll reach out to you. So, I would say both routes work. Yes, um, so I also uh, answered an ad, an online ad, for my first job, and it was a set of skills, and in my case, I worked with antifungals uh, through my, my PhD and my postdoc, and they wanted to have somebody with antimicrobial experience. Um, but I wanted to say that uh, there are jobs, uh, there are, there are um, contract labs, and then there is pharmaceutical companies, and the contra labs are, in, in, 
that was my first job as a contract lab. Normally, they probably pay less, there's more stress. However, they seem to give more opportunity for people that are coming directly from academia. It's easier to land a job in a contract lab. Um, the contract labs around here are Catlin, KBI. Um, there's, a, there's a couple more uh, contract labs, but Biogenetics. Um, and they, 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 in my case, they give me the opportunity coming directly from academia. And so that is one of the people normally end up working a couple of years in those contract labs, getting a lot of experience, especially because they really teach you how to document. And, and you are, because it's a contract lab, you end up getting projects for many different companies. So you kind of get experience really fast and infused in longer hours. However, um, later on, uh, I've seen also, and I was one of those people who was able to move to a, a better paying job and less stress and you know more better hours. And you're talking, so you're talking about contract research organizations. Contract right? research labs, yeah. Or, yeah, contract research labs. And is it true that um, big big companies are more and more moving outsourcing to yes. CROs? Yes. Yeah, yes, yeah. CROs and CMOs, so contract manufacturing. So if you if there's a particular um, process that you that you want implemented but you just can't have that in your facility, you would pay this company to, to journey their materials, the same same kind of thing for contract research organizations. So research would be for the particular aspect and you know, all of that. So I um, I think the I, I think those are really great opportunities like uh, um, Christina had mentioned they are I, I know a lot of people who have worked in that environment it's, it's it's fairly stressful because you need you you have someone basically overseeing the, the company that has hired you for that contract to produce that material or to do that research. There's ex, you, know, you have deadlines, you know, every and you have milestones that you need to hit. So it's it's a lot. It is quite a quite a bit of stress, you know, for uh, for a lot of people that um, have worked in that type of environment. But I think it's a really good uh, opportunity. I think. Um, mo I think a lot of people who actually work, um, that I work with, have, have been through that situation as well, and I think you're, you're better off for it because then you know how to get things done, you know, in a, in a timely manner, but um, I think it's a really good study, so. And how did you get your job? Right. So, um, I was at, uh, well, fit it, almost exactly what I was doing already. Um, so it, it turned out that um, I, I believe since it, the, the role I think was so was so specific for uh, what the, the company needed, what the, what the actual need was, and then I was able to fill it, I think that was really um, how I was able to get the job. So I think that, you know, that w the roles that, that they needed were directly tangible to what I was I was doing, so I think that's that's pretty important. Um, so for you know what a question that probably is, is good to ask yourself is what are you an expert in, or what what is your strongest ask, what's the best thing that you should do, what can you bring for uh, this company? And so if, you, if they're looking for that exact need, then you have a lot better chance of you know um, of getting a, a call back. So if it's something that you know if you're really specific on um, that you're specific working on, and then um, so like if I'm a virologist and I'm you know focused on virology, I'm not going to go looking for like uh, a cancer research type of job. You know, they're they, they, the people who are screening resumes are going to be able to look through that. Mm -hmm. Liz, how about you? So pretty much the same as some of the other people mentioned. I um, I answered an ad. The ad was written for a really specific person um, working with a specific virus in a high containment lab that had security clearance. And there's only three of those labs in the U.S. Um, so they pretty much wrote the job description for me, and I'd never met them before. So it was it was an easy choice. There were only a few of us that had those qualifications. And again, it's um, the one of the things I think a lot of people don't realize is we don't see your resumes until they be screened by someone who's not a scientist. 
So <coughs> I think you're the one that mentioned, um, make sure the words match exactly because an HR person doesn't know science. And the quicker that they can screen and see the exact same words, tailor your resume to every job, it'll help you get at least a foot in the door. If it's not the exact job you want, you may want to consider it as a stepping stone and then learn more and grow with the company. Unless you get somebody in the company who will give you that resume. So if you know yes. somebody that will land it in the yes. desk, then yeah, I think you will. A lot of it is, uh, yeah. is timing and opportunity. So uh, if, if someone needs to hire a scientist, that scientist level could be basically a, a technician all the way up to like a you know, senior scientist or, or even higher. And so there's like a big range in what you know companies are looking for. So it's not necessarily like if a job posting that indicates like a you know a PhD level that it automatically indicates anybody with a PhD it could be someone that just like, just graduated PhD or they're looking for someone with you know you know 15 years experience in a particular um, arena, right? So a lot of it has to do with timing and opportunity, I believe. So you you all talked about kind of you know, for most of you, for all of you really, like you you applied for jobs that were a perfect fit for you, and a lot of postdocs look at job ads and they're like, okay, maybe I fit 50. Is, is, would it still be worth it for them to apply if they can fit 50% and if they can tailor? And are there other things that postdocs and graduate students can do to add value to themselves? So, for example, you know, um, uh, uh, BTEC offers classes on CGMP, like short courses. Is that going to help, or is that something that people are like, and can learn that on the job? So well, that's I think kind of the question. Anything like that would, would help um, someone who's looking to get. I think a, a big aspect of it is is networking. So, you know, it's for I, I know when I was you know going through graduate school, networking sounded you know something that you would do. It doesn't sound that that fun to do. It doesn't. It seems like you're like cheating or you know you're not you're, you're building yourself up more than you're you should. But it's it's really something that you know, that really will, could help you in the end when you're actually looking for a job. So, you know, go on, uh, go on LinkedIn, go to, go to meetings, go to, and talk to, talk to different people, you know, follow up on different contacts. Um, networking is, is, is pretty important. Um, e even if, even if you get into industry, um, that, that networking should still continue just because, you know, I think, you know, Cassandra got, got her second job based on what, you know, networking from her first position, right? So I think that's 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 a fairly uh, common thing to do. So I, I think that's really important to, to work on. Yeah. Um, I would add into that. Um, so in terms of areas and things like that that they're looking for, so with my first role, um, my hiring manager had come, so she worked previously in industry and then went and got her PhD and then was back out of the industry for like a year. So she was specifically looking for somebody with postdoc experience. So I would say sometimes that's, it's not rare, but she was willing to take a chance on me not having GMP experience and knew that. And so, you know, during my interview process, I asked, you know, what is going to be the most challenging part of this position? And she said to me, um, getting used to working in a GMP environment, she said the documentation is the by far the hardest part. And, you know, it takes a, it's a big adjustment. So I would say sometimes you see a lot of companies may not want to take that chance if you don't have that experience. Um, so if you can take classes on, on GMP and learning and understanding what that means and getting used to, like if you're not keeping lab notebooks, try to get used to keeping lab notebooks, the documentation that goes in with that and trying to understand how like, what you do <coughs> impacts um, other areas. So for instance, like if you're doing, setting up an experiment and thinking like, how can I do this experiment 50 times, 100 times the exact same way and ensure that nothing changes, nothing you know, that I'm conducting it the same way, because that's exactly what they're going to want in industry, is that if you're going to develop something, they want to make sure that it's robust, that they, like Christine was saying, and that you can do it over and over and over and over and over again. That you can hand this off to somebody else who does not have maybe a whole lot of lab experience, and then they can take that and run it on a continuous basis. So I would definitely say that I got lucky in that respect of having that GMP experience. Um, 
And then with my current role, they specifically wanted that GED experience. Like I would not have gotten my second job without my first job. Um, they wanted somebody who already understood um, working with regulatory agencies, the needs um, required for working with regulatory agencies, keeping good documentation, um, thinking about experiments, thinking about how you can standardize those experiments for the future when you hand them off to somebody, how you can write that up um, in a procedure or a form or an SOP such that other people can do that long term. So um, I would say if there's any classes or things like that that you can take, like in tech or things like that, it's, it would give you a better foot in the door in terms of those types of things. Um, because I know sometimes like I have friends that reach out to me and say, hey, you know, that are, that are still postdocs and say, hey, I'm looking for a job and this and that. And I've heard time and time again that sometimes people don't want to take that chance on hiring a postdoc or a graduate student if you don't have that experience. Like, if you're going straight into research, research and development, yes, they will likely take that chance. But if you're heading into like supporting manufacturing or supporting GMP, sometimes they don't want to take that chance if you don't have that skill set. And that's what I think they construct apps, kind of like hire people that have very little experience. I think one of the things is that, you know, when you're a postdoc and maybe your lab is, is a, has kind of like the same a, a variety of techniques that everybody has, you know, westerns and, you know, gels and, and maybe, um, I don't know, maybe HPLCs, something that is like everybody, there's no such a very specific or tremendous skill, uh, but it's in general the whole research that you're doing. So then now you need to kind of find what things can make you more attractive because there are gonna be a hundred people having the same techniques that you are listing in those resumes. So you need to think about what would make it more exciting. If I look at the CV, what, so something like I took a class in GLP, CMP, you know, GCP, uh, GLP, something like that, or I, a, the, a, or going into more onto the technique that you have, uh, but maybe uh, discussing how you develop method methods and how you um, a, have collaborated with other uh, teams in, in in different departments or something that brings up you know something be beyond the many skills that a lot of people are going to have. So. It's finding those, maybe collaborating, maybe becoming really like a big expert in one technique and, and saying all the things that you have done for that technique. Um, so that will make be uh, um, make the resume a little bit more attractive. Yeah. How about you? Yeah. You, you marketing. Yeah, so I would say one of the things that I've learned, and, and, and you touched on it a bit, is the more different people you can work with. I know when I was in grad school and when I was doing my postdoc, my main focus was to do my job and get it done. But one of the other things that I did is I tried to learn what everybody else in the lab was doing and what everybody else in the department was doing. The more broad experience you can come out with, the, the more you can work with different groups. Um, you work individually for the most time on your postdoc in your, your grad school. I never work by myself. I'm always on teams. So communication is a, a key. If you don't like speaking in groups, take a speaking course. Do something to where you force yourself to talk. Um, Work across groups so you you can work with the team. You know, it's kind of like the team projects you did in high school. There's people who perform well, there's people who don't, but you still have to work with them day in, day out, and figure out how to make that work. Um, and the more that you can, so I guess I'm asked to do both. I'm asked to be the expert in the stuff that I went to school with and worked on, but I'm also asked to be the expert in any infectious disease an animal can get. And that's a really hard thing to do. So you need to be able to show that you really have a deep understanding of science and you can apply it to different things. You don't really have to be the be all end all and know everything about everything, but you need to have enough of a basic understanding that you can transfer that somewhere else. And you have to be able to do that in an interview as well to show that you really have the focus and you really know what you know, but you can also apply it to other things. That's good advice. And you sort of touched on one of the questions, um, like personality traits. Do you, you know, a lot of scientists consider themselves to be introverted, does it, does it matter? Does it help to be an extrovert? Yes. <laughs> well, I think that it's, it's knowledge when it's your turn to speak up. And if it's a, a subject that 
that you're supposed to be um, an expert on or that that you have awareness to. It's just that that timing of when you're supposed to when you're supposed to speak up. You know, you if it's if it's at that moment where you need to you know you know you need to say something or else you know something will um, negative will happen. You just have to be able to stand up and say, you know, this is this is not right. This is something that we need to change or this is you know, science isn't right here. So I, I think that I mean being I think being an extrovert helps because a lot of day to day things that you do involve communication. Communication is very important with other people, but I also think that being an, um, being an introvert can also, you know, people who are introverts can also thrive um, in, the, in the type of roles that, that we have. It's just, it's just um, knowing when to speak up and knowing, you know, wh what areas you're responsible for so that you can sort of take charge in that moment. So it's something that I think you take, it takes time to to, to work on, um, particularly for some people. So. And I will say, I'm one of those people, I am, I'm an introvert. We do the um, personality traits at work. I'm, I'm all the way on the wall. At the end of the day, I want to go home. I don't want to be around people. Um, so, it, so it's hard for me, and I'm in marketing, and I'm in global marketing. So I'm surrounded by global people, really touchy-feely. They want to know how your day is. They want to come in and give you a hug in the morning. And so it's, it's a little, it was a, it's, it's been a growing experience for me. And I've had to learn, um, so a lot of the things, like I read a lot, lean in's a big one, especially for women. Um, make sure you sit at the table. If there's a conference room, make yourself sit at the table. It's a little uncomfortable at first. Come in from day one, knowing that you belong. You know, if they didn't want you there, you wouldn't be there. And like as Jeff said, speak up. Um, you don't have to speak the whole time. But I find that because I don't speak, at every single meeting all the time when I do speak people listen but you know make sure what you what you say has it's important it has impact people know you're listening if you sit in the back of the room if you have a closed posture which I do I usually sit like this I know it I know it's bad um, but you know you have to make sure people know you're engaged and you're paying attention and, and you care because when you are introverted in a business and you're really in the business part where most people are extroverted you can be overlooked if you're not working hard I think one of the um, characteristics that you're looking for somebody and at least when I hire somebody is to see that they are proactive. Somebody who is, you know, you have only like one chance to do a, a first good impression. So um, when you go into a company and get a job, um, you know, you work hard, you, you, you never say this is not my job, you jump in the opportunities to do something more for um, that is not your responsibility. And people look at those uh, qualities, and those are the qualities, those are the people that you keep an eye, and they, they are the people that are gonna be promoted. So it's, it's getting there, it's being enthusiastic, it's saying, it's being confident, no arrogant, but confident, yes, I can do this, I'm willing to do this, I'm looking forward to this. So you, when you go and interview, you this is what you're looking for. Somebody who you know has some excitement that you want to work. You know if you go and you know if you don't have eye contact, if you don't get a, a good vibe from that person. I mean you can be nervous. Like I'm right now, I'm a little nervous, but that's okay. You know, uh, but it shows excitement. Shows that you are you care that you're enthusiastic of what you are asking them to give you an opportunity. So yeah, so proactive team player, uh, do things for other people, and if you're gonna do it, don't complain after, oh, I did it, you know, just be good all the way. If you're gonna do it, good all the way. People appreciate that, that's the type of people you wanna have around. So I'll add on to, to what Christine said. So, uh, so in my previous role, as I worked with a lot of cross-functional teams, um, I would try to make sure that I'd always speak to people when you see them in the hallway. I know it, a lot of people don't really think about that, but that matters. Like if you constantly walk by somebody and don't say anything to them, they'll remember that when you're coming to ask them for a favor. Um, so a lot of times I'd have to go to different groups and you know say, hey, I really need this. And unfortunately in the role that I was in, a lot, everything was like firefighting. So it was like it needed to be done yesterday. Um, and so if you show that you're willing to help other people, so if they come to you last minute and say, hey, I really need this, and you put forth the effort to help them out, then when the time comes, so like a lot of times I would have to, it's 
interact with lots of different groups that didn't have science backgrounds. So, for instance, if we were like validating or um, qualifying the lab, uh, there's a lot of work going on with like engineering services to get the equipment up and running and validated and qualified. So I'd have to explain to them why I needed them to be on time for their deliverables in order so that I can meet my deliverables. Because let's say in the end, my final deliverable was the only thing that people saw as the next theme to being able to continue manufacturing the recovery. They didn't see the 20 different projects beforehand that all had to happen first before my piece came in. They only saw if my piece was late, people would know that. So then you have to build that good rapport with other groups and kind of say, hey, I understand you have delays, please communicate those with me, please talk, you know, and making sure that you have those open lines of communication. So sometimes I'm definitely introverted and there's other times where I have to force myself to be extroverted to say, I'm gonna go in this meeting, I'm gonna speak up. There's times where I've had to say to our um, executive director of operations, this is this project is behind, this is gonna impact manufacturing by X, Y, and Z, you know, and then you have to just be confident and be able to go in and explain how to do that. Is that an uncomfortable situation? Yes, it is. You know, but you just have to be confident and understand and be able to go in there and to speak to what you know and to, you know, have the data, have the information. So you've got to be able to work with lots of different groups, whether you, your job description says that or not, because building those relationships is how you move forward, because you will need those people. It may be your quality group, you need them to approve a report. Um, it may be four o'clock on a Friday afternoon and you need that by midnight on Friday in order to not have a deviation. So you're asking that person to now work in the middle of the night to get something approved for you. And if you have a good report for them, they'll likely be willing to do it. If you never speak to them and you're not nice to them or things like that, they're gonna say, not my problem. So. One little thing, um, the writing skills, I, I would say that that's another characteristic. So uh, that's something that you're looking for uh, when you, at least I look for when I, when I see a resume. So I, I think it's something, if you have ever the opportunity to write, you know, you're gonna write some papers with your advisors, and, but if you have an opportunity to go beyond that, write a chapter or something, uh, they give you the opportunity to show that that is you who's writing that, um, then, that, that is a plus. So it's, it's, it's one of the skills that you're really looking for. And you just kind of touched on something. One question <coughs> always comes up, well, two questions always come up, the second one about salary. But the first one is, um, do you miss academic research? How did you decide to make the leap? And postdocs always want to know, like, yeah. are there regrets about going to industry? <laughs> <laughs> so I think that for, um, when you're doing your research in academia, usually you do research on a particular subject for <coughs> for very long periods of time. Usually your PI will spend their whole life working on a particular subject. Um, but in, in industry, it's more of, there's more churn in terms of projects. Something you can work on for a couple of years might be immediately stopped one day and then you can't work on, you don't work on it anymore and all of a sudden you pick up on something else. So there's that there's that sort of turn through. So you have opportunities for you know working on different projects, and but in, you know in academia you can if, if you're a postdoc or you know if you have your own lab you're able to work on a particular subject. You know you have more more freedom to work on what what you want to do in, in academia. I think. Yeah, I like the change though. I like the you know you work on a project for a few months or a few years and then you either move it on to someone else or or you or, or it ends because it's not moving forward and, and for me my day to day is completely different every day. Um, I did love academic research and at one point thought I would never do anything else. Um, but I do again I like the freedom, I like the different opportunities get I get. I like the travel, working with people all over the world, and I do not miss grant writing. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't want uh, my partner is a professor and the idea of both of us surviving on, on grant writing wasn't exciting to me. I would agree with that statement. When I was in, when I was in my postdoc, um, I really observed how my postdoc advisor was. He was the chair of the department, um, and he was constantly writing grants, trying to ensure that we had funding. And you know, you go through ebbs and flows um, with the NIH in terms of like about to lose all of your funding, and then all of a sudden grants come back in. 
you know, and kind of constantly having that ebbs and flows. So whenever he was traveling for conferences or vacations or whatever, he was always running a grant, sometimes one to two grants. I'm like, really, you're traveling in Italy, you know, on vacation, and you're on the beach riding a grant. That's not exactly how I wanted, how I wanted to, to do that. So for me, that was not the lifestyle that I wanted to have long term. So I knew, like, moving forward that I did not want to be in academics, but I kind of made that decision at the end of my graduate career that I didn't want to be in academics anymore and I knew I wanted to go into industry. I decided to do a postdoc so that I could help build some of the skill sets and some of the techniques and things like that that can make myself marketable um, during that time frame. So, and then to give me the chance to network and to figure out how do I get my foot in the door into industry. So I used my postdoc as that time frame to help figure out how to take that next step into my career. Um, and so being in industry, I don't regret it. I, it's a very good change. Um, so I probably worked on a project like four years. And probably by the end of that fourth year, I was getting a little bit like tired of that project and wanting to move on to something different. So I like that about industry is that you get to do new things and, and change. And um, So sometimes you think that that's a, a downside, but sometimes it's, it keeps you flowing. It keeps your motivation to work on different projects and to work on different ideas and to learn from something that because you're a scientist, people expect you to be able to just sometimes take on something different that you've never even done before, and to read papers to figure out how to do it and to, to get the job done. So I definitely like that aspect of it. Um, again, the documentation is the hardest part. Um, you get used to that. Um, I get to go in the lab and, and, and play around now, being an active development, as, as Christine was describing. Like, it's fun. I get to go say, hey, I want to figure out this answer. And go in the lab and start doing it. So it's a lot more like my postdoc, but a little bit more structured in terms of the documentation. So, so. I, I think it was the same. You know, I early on in my graduate school um, years, I, I knew that I, I wanted to be in, in industry. I, I used to dream that I was in research and, and discovery. That's the part that I, I, I didn't end up exactly in research and discovery. However, um, I, I do like my job. I, I go every day happy to be in the job that I have right now. Love it. Uh, I work, I have um, seven people in my group, um, you know, discussing <coughs> science, um, having the opportunity to travel, um, <coughs> getting good pay. Um, so all sorts of those things make me happy. Um, besides that, I sort of like to see the application, the direct application of what I do. So because I support clinical trials, um, and I get to uh, sometimes see the patients, and I, all the patients that are actually taking the drugs that we help put in, in the market. So, and I know that what I did the last five years or seven years, um, was key, was key or it was important for that to happen um, and for the safety of the patients. So the company, uh, my company has like our open houses for patients and they come and they tell the story about, you know, how they, the drugs have made changed their lives and everything and that's a satisfying moment mm -hmm. um, because you know that, you know, even if you have worked hard, somebody else is really uh, getting all the, uh, it's rewarding to see people getting better, you know, because of the work that you have done. So it's kind of like an application. Like when I was in basic science, it was rewarding to see that paper and excitement and everything. And uh, this one is to see what, what we do is use. So it seems like kind of a, you know, Academia has grant writing, but I think we've all read about the recent layoffs at GSK. It, do you expect that as part of your as part of your job? Is it something that people are just pick up and go ahead from, or how does that? Uh, I'll talk about one. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so recently, I just like I said, I just switched positions. But um, right as I was going to switch positions, um, probably a year before that, my company announced that they were going to do layoffs. Um, they didn't really specify how that was going to look. They just said they were cutting about 20% of the company overall. So, um, 
it took a while to, to kind of roll that out, and that made a lot of people nervous. So in that time frame, um, a lot of people switched and left their company, and some people stayed, and I was one of the people who stayed, to see what that new rollout looked like. Um, so I survived that. I mean, I, I didn't get laid off or anything. But, um, you know, when I kind of saw the direction that the company was heading in after it, and I said to me, I said for me, you know, I wanted to do something different. Um, but I think it's inevitable. You're going to experience it in some fashion. You know, either you're going to be laid off, somebody close to you is going to be laid off, your company is going to downsize, they're going to completely move your group to some other location, and you have to make a decision on whether you want to stay or go. Um, so just, it's pretty inevitable. Just accept that that's a part of being in an industry, and then you learn to grow with it and keep yourself marketable every time you're, like when you get into a position, don't just get comfortable and say, now I'm here. <laughs> you know, keep building your skill sets, keep your resume active, you know, keep talking to people and knowing people because you never know when you're going to need to make that transition and change. Yeah, and just to go on top of I mean, I've survived two. I've been in the same company eight years and this is my second or third job. The reason I landed in marketing is because I'm one of the people who help people get stuff done. Um, and when my whole group got um, shut down and moved to Michigan, um, it wasn't a move that I was willing to take, but the company saw value in me, and so they took a chance on putting me in a completely odd position for me because I was someone they could count on and could get things done when they needed to get done. So the, when people come to you for help, try to help as much as you can. Be a helper, don't be a hindrance to people. You do have to say no sometimes, and that's part of it too because we have a lot of stuff that's given to us, but try to help people as much as you can because one day that person will be your boss, they'll buy your company, They'll report to you, I and mean, we've, we've bought six companies and sold seven over the last eight years, so it, it's a constant change. Can I add in one other thing? So like the people that you work with, keep a good rapport with them because you will see them again. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they will be at a different company, Absolutely. your company will then work for that company, and you will see them again. So if you have, yes, if you have conflicts, keep it to yourself. You will see them again. So in, in, in my thir 13 years in industry, I have survived seven of those layoffs. I never been there, but, um, but I think it's because, again, um, it's, it's working towards making yourself to be necessary that people really see the value in having you there and being flexible. But even when, when people um, <coughs> lost their job, um, the majority of them, I would say, 90% they landed a job within three to six months. Mm -hmm. That was, sometimes they have to move, but there was all the opportunities in here. Sometimes they have to go, let's pay, you know, go to the contract labs. Or sometimes there was, it, it was because of the skill set that they had, they were able to develop while they were working in the company, they were able to land a job that it was equally in another company. But I think it's keeping your skill set, uh, working, networking, and let me tell you, if you if some if you go to a company and you work in a way that people remember you, uh, they will always remember you like that. And then somebody will say, Oh yeah, I remember working with that guy. Yeah, you know, yeah, he wasn't that, you know, yeah, he was okay. I mean, and then somebody who's interviewing, you don't want somebody okay. You know, you want to go, oh yeah, that guy was great. You know, he help and this and that, he was proactive, he was um, enthusiastic, all of those things. That's what you want to hear. And everybody knows everybody in here. So we were sitting down here and in, in two, three minutes, we knew people in common, many people in common. So you, you need that, those impressions um, and working um, the best that you can, it's, it's important to keep a job in industry. <laughs> uh, so, like in my current role, um, what I didn't know when I was interviewing for my position is one of the people on the team um, used to work for my old company. I didn't know the person, um, but because she knew that I worked for the old company, reached out to somebody at, at my old company and asked like what they thought of me. You know, I didn't know this at the time. Um, that person gave me, you know, a good a, a good report on how I worked. And so basically, when I got hired on and talked to that person later, she was like, oh yeah, I, I totally reached out to my friend at, at our old company to see you know, what she thought of you. And she's like, you know, she gave me high remarks, but 
had she not, so like if I had not been nice to that person, had not been willing to work with that person, I wouldn't have gotten that job. So, and I wouldn't have even known why I didn't get that job. So. Yeah, I call people's references, but I also call someone else I know from the company that wasn't listed. And that's, that's the way it is. It's a small world now. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the important things when you are um, like interviewing mm -hmm. and is normally at the level if you getting a, is it a PhD level, you're probably going to have to give a seminar, you know, a presentation, 30 minutes. And one of the things that I find is that uh, people, if they do a great presentation and, and they tell you the whole story, um, and that includes your work and other people's work, and it's very nicely put, and, you know, because most likely people have heard it, you know, and help you, yes, it's like worthwhile. But I think, uh, uh, and that's kind of, that's fine. However, I think people need to uh, focus more on what they have done, and that that has, has come through that presentation. I did this part, and also the other part is to be um, a, to put a little bit more emphasis sometimes on those skills and the techniques. People want to see, okay, yeah, and the data, present its own data, um, and the technique that they want to highlight. Because sometimes it's, it's just the, th the theory and everything is fine, but uh, after 30 minutes you don't know whether that, that person did uh, or whether that person can use that instrument, that the half a million instrument dollars that you have upstairs, and that's what you are hiding, in, you know, that's what you're interviewing this person. So it has to be uh, more uh, towards the technical part. And be ready to answer questions about techniques, be ready, because that's if, you were, if they're hiring you because you know how to use a mass spec, then you need to know um, the software that they have, the instrument, the, who services, who this, and all of those questions, uh, uh, because you're not gonna have time to think about that in, that in that second, but that is maybe why they're hiring you for that specific technique. Highlight it in your interview, highlight it in your presentation, show what you do, no, by the other people in your lab. Don't make it up. Because we'll know, we'll know within a minute if we ask you a question. Exactly. And if you're misrepresenting yourself in the interview, you're finished within five minutes. So be honest with what you do and don't know. And, wow, we are almost out of time. This was a great discussion. So I'm going to ask the, the salary question because everybody wants to know. If you could talk a little bit about what an entry level a recent PhD graduate or postdoc might make in your company. If you have any idea. So I think <clears throat> I don't mean to deflect the question, but I think that <laughs> I think it's, it, it really depends on the company size and what they're actually looking for, where, what the position level is, and then also uh, who who is being hired. So I think there's there's a actually a fairly wide range um, in salary for either coming right out of the PhD or um, out of a postdoc. Um, I think it really it really depends on the situation. You can't. I don't think we can sit up here and just give you a, a number. I, I think it's, it really depends on a, a very, you know. I think it depends on all the factors involved. <coughs> um, so I would add to that. Um, so when I went on interviews, um, and a lot of times I'll ask you what your salary expectation is. So I would look at salary.com or Glassdoor for like that specific um, position that you're looking. And it'll give you a range of salary for that particular position so you can know like, what's considered acceptable for that area and different things like that. Um, one of the things I realized in coming out is, so your starting salary uh, with where, however you start kind of defines a little bit of where you go into your next um, jobs and things like that. So for instance, like if you come out straight as a graduate student, you're likely going to make less than if you came out as your postdoc, as your starting salary. And then your next job is going to be based on what your current salary is. So if you've gotten into a company and you've had some raises and, and you, you know, have gone up, they're going to base it off of that salary. But let's say if you did a postdoc and you came in $20,000 more than if you just come out of your graduate school, then you're going to start there and you're going to move up that way. So that's one of the things I definitely have noticed um, in terms of like 
and I had friends that went directly from graduate school and got positions, and um, when I did my postdoc, that our salaries are not exactly the same, you know, in terms of things like that. So, but if you really want to know like the numbers, I would look at like Glassdoor and Salary.com, and look at your experience of putting like PhD with however many experiences you kind of get the gist of what it should be. The other thing I would also add is like definitely know your worth when you want to interview, um, because Depending on the company, you could get a range of offers. Whether offers that show that they really respect you as a scientist, and sometimes offers that show that they really don't respect you as a scientist. But if you don't know what that range should be and what your value is, then you might accept that. So um, definitely know that going into interviews and things like that. I mean, and sometimes I'll ask you. So. Yeah, I think for, I mean, I think for larger companies, you know, once you get to that stage where you're making someone an offer, they really want that person. You know, it's not like, you know, like, okay, this is our, you know, seventh or eighth, you know, selection based on this, but we're just going to give it to this person. They, if you get an, if you get an offer, they really want that person. So I, I think that salary, I think, probably is commensurate with what you know the expectation of you is. So I, I think I think that where where you get the um, Sort of, I don't know. I, I think about smaller companies, you might you might say, okay, you know, if you need to, we're going to essentially give you a, a lower salary, but you need to pro prove how you're worth, and then you can move up. You know, so I think that's it. Really depends on the situation. But for, I think for larger companies, it's a little bit more, a little bit different. And sometimes, if you you can negotiate with the And sometimes if they, they say, well, we can't meet the salary because of this, and you may negotiate some signing bonus, you know, a little bit more for that, or a little bit more PTOs, um, you know, vacation days. So there, there are ways that you can, but make sure that you don't go too far. Yeah. All right, we have reached the end of our hour. Let's thank our panelists.